The last time that we were together, y'all remember what we talked about. We talked about how tribulation works on our behalf. And today we're really going to deal with almost the same subject. Uh, we're going to be coming out of Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, verses 31 through 32. Most of you could quote this. Uh, most of you could uh, read it or record, uh, repeat it right out of your heart. Uh, but we're going to read it and we're going to uh, let the Lord bless us today in whatever way it seems fit. This is a, a passage that's really personal to my own heart. I'll share that experience with you towards the end of the message. Uh, but it's something that the Lord's used mightily in my life. And I pray today that this message here uh, would be used by God to work mightily in your life today. To strengthen you, to encourage you. And to lift you up if you might be going through something that you think is set to destroy you. And uh, let's go ahead and read Luke chapter 22, verses 31 through 32. And before I get started, I just want you guys to know that I've queued these three guys up. Uh, they rode down with me in the car. They're the A-man corner. They, I've queued them up just exactly when they need to shout. <laughs> they know. They know right at that right time. So when they shout, y'all just follow along. Shout with them. <laughs> Uh, all right, verses 31 through 32. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon. This is the Lord speaking. Jesus Christ speaking to Peter. And he names him by name twice. That means it's very important what he's about to say. Something very important that Peter needs to understand. That's coming up. That's going to try him. It's going to be difficult for him. And it's right ahead of him. And the Lord says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you. I want you to know today that that's true for each and every one of us. Yes. Satan <coughs> hath desired to have you. That he may sift you as wheat. But I, I need you to get that today. But I, Jesus Christ, I have prayed for you. Amen. Glory to God. Yes. There is no better statement that could ever be made. Yes. I have prayed for you. Amen. I have prayed for you. Listen to this. Here's the fight. That thy faith fail not. Yes. There's the fight. Yes. There's the war. That's what the war is all about. That thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, that's a word of prophecy. You can take that to the bank. When you are converted, when you are turned towards me, glory to God, strengthen thy brother. My Lord, I'm telling you, that's good news. And I'll explain that as we keep going. But the Lord has prayed for Simon, even though Satan's going to come for him, the Lord's prayed for him that his faith would not fail. And when he is converted, not born again, not converted in the reference of being born again, he's already saved. But when he turns back to the Lord, go and strengthen your brother. And that's a promise from the Lord to Simon. That's a promise. And you can take that today as a promise to your own personal situation. That's the promise from the Lord today, that your faith fell not, and when you are converted, strengthen thy brother. We live in a world today where a lot of value is placed upon material things. A whole lot of value is placed upon material things. These are some of the most highly valued products in our world today. Amen. You look at somebody, when you go into a, a, a restaurant, or you go into a, um, a, a place of business, wherever you may be, you're always going to see somebody on their cell phone. Always. And you might sit in a ta at a table, sit down to dinner, and you're looking at people around you, and they never once look up from the phone. Now, that, that's definitely true for our generation today. That's just the reality of the thing. We are a technology generation. And uh, there's a lot of value put on that. There's a lot of value in the world put on money, prestige, power, prosperity, publicity. Get your name out there. You've got to be known. There's a lot of prestige. There's a lot of value placed in these things. And uh, they are among some of the most sought after commodities in the earth today. But I want to talk to you today about the most valuable commodity 
that exists in the earth today. And that is faith. Yes. Amen. Truly Amen. biblical. Y'all heard the key, right? Yes. Amen. I'm just checking. Okay. <laughs> biblical, correctly placed faith. Yes. The most valuable thing in the earth today. And do you know where it resides? In each and every one <clears throat> of us. The most valuable, precious jewel on the earth today is faith. Yes. Truly biblical, anchored, correct object, that in the cross of Calvary, faith. Faith is so valuable. And there are two treasure hunters, if you will, that are said their entire existence for seeking out such faith. That is God in heaven. He is looking over the whole earth for a heart that he can use. The Bible talks about that. It talks about it when he was uh, looking for one on the earth uh, in the days of Noah. He found none but one. But he sought the whole earth looking for one, just one, that might have faith. And he's still doing that today. He's looking for anyone who might have faith in the earth today. He's seeking them out. But there's another one who's also seeking out for faith like this. And his name is Satan. And they are both, their entire existence has been given over to seeking out those of this biblical correct faith. Looking for them. Seeking them. One, to strengthen them. The other, to destroy them. That's, what, that's the war that we find ourselves in today. If you could see the heavenlies today, I don't think that we could bear it. The fight that's taking place for each and every one of you today. For myself, we are in a war zone. Soldier, you're in a war zone. Yes. And it's a war zone for your faith. And there is a fight that's taking place. This war is going to go on until the trump of God does sound. And then even after that, it will take place. And then Christ will return to reign forever. Amen. I'm looking forward to that day. Amen. We talked about that the, the time before I was here. That's going to be a good day, isn't it? Yes. I'm looking forward to that day. Now, Jesus is, uh, Jesus is going to allow the devil to come for your faith. Yes. He has to. Mm -hmm. It has to be tested. It has to be tried. It has to be put to the fire. It has to be crushed under the weight of the threat on the threshing floor. It has to be squeezed to the last drop, heated up, and squeezed again in the Garden of Gethsemane. It has to be tested. This is the most valuable thing on the face of the planet today. Being tested and purified and strengthened. And the enemy is going to be allowed an opportunity to come for it. Notice the Lord never said. He never said that the devil won't be able to try. He just said, I prayed for you. Yes. The devil's going to get an opportunity at it. Yes, he will. But I want you to look at this. But Jesus Christ has prayed for you. Amen. That your faith fail not. Lord. And I want to preach a message today entitled, Faith That Cannot Fail. Faith That Cannot Fail. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we come to you today in the name of Jesus, Lord, and we thank you once again. Lord, for what you've already accomplished in this service today. Thank you for your presence, Lord. Lord, as we talked about entering in to the Holy of Holies, Lord, we enter in, Lord, by the blood of the Lamb, Lord. And we thank you, Lord. We come into your presence at this moment, Lord. And we ask you that the anointing of the Holy Spirit would come, that the power of the Comforter would come, and that he would anoint me, Lord, and to utilize this vessel to bring only glory and honor to the kingdom of God and to my heavenly Father. And Lord, I lift up these under the sound of my voice. God, I'm asking you that you would give them a spirit of wisdom and a spirit of revelation in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That you would give them revelation knowledge of your word. That you would open their eyes and let them see, Lord God, the reality 
of this faith. And Lord, we're asking that for myself and for those here today. Lord, anoint this service, Lord. And, and I pray that if there be any, Lord God, who are going through a trial or a temptation, and it seems like they're going to draw away and wander away, God, that you would grab hold of their heart and seal them into thy courts above. Lord, and we give you glory today. We give you honor today. And we thank you, Lord. All for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen and amen. Now Jesus is just moments away. It's not that long before He'll be arrested. He'll be beaten. He'll be scourged. He'll experience the scourging of the lictor's lash. And He'll be crucified. The most agonizing death ever recorded in history. And Jesus is only moments away from this. And Peter is a zealous man. Not always thinks, doesn't always think before he speaks. He's a fireball, really. He's a man of faith. At this time, he's a man of faith. But Peter is about to be tried in a way that he could never imagine. In fact, he'll even say it the next verses down, Lord, I would go with you to death. I will be in prison for you. I'll go with you to death. And this is Peter. Truly a man of faith. A man who loved the Lord. A man who gave his all. Left everything behind. Left his business that him and his father and his brothers had been running. And left it all to his father. And left his, uh, and I don't know if his wife traveled with him. We know she did in, in the future missionary journeys. But we don't know if she did during the time of Christ. But Maybe left his wife behind. Maybe left his children behind. To follow the Lord for his uh, earthly ministry. Gave his entire life over to Jesus Christ. And this man was about to deny the Lord. Not once. Not twice. But three times. Peter said, I will, I will never, ever, ever <coughs> fail you, Lord. And the Lord says, Peter... You're just going to, you're not only going to fail me, you're going to deny that you even know me three times. And Peter has to be prepared for this. God's got to make him ready for this. And, and we, we're moving into this passage, and uh, that's where the Lord takes us. And he says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you. Satan, the accuser, he's the accuser, the destroyer, the great adversary. He's contrary. He's the prince of the power of the air. Uh, he's worthlessness. He's the dragon, the angel of light. He's the one that's roaming across the earth today, seeking whom he may devour. He's the thief. He's the enemy. He's the one that's come to steal, to kill and destroy. He is the great deceiver. You know, last night as I sat with uh, a woman who was uh, dying, I sat there and I began to weep as I thought about all the hell that the devil has brought to humanity. Now, of course, we have our own part to play in it. We accepted his offer. But look at what all he's, he's the father of lies. And I began to weep and express to the Lord how I hated him and how I wanted my entire life to be devoted to destroying his kingdom. There's a story in, in Numbers uh, chapter 25. You don't have to bring it up. I'm, I'm not exactly sure of the verses. But Numbers 25, and it's, uh, it's at the end of the passage. And it's, it's after uh, Balaam has come to, for Balak to curse the children of Israel. Balak uh, hired a man of God or so-called prophet of God to curse the children of Israel. And Balaam would give us some of the most powerful prophecies found in the Word of God about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're talking about a man who came so that he could curse the children of God. And he would provide us with some of the most dynamic prophecies regarding the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But yet, uh, we believe, and it seems as if though he counseled some of the kings of that area and taught them what might cause the children of Israel some issues and some problems... And uh, that, that was taken up by the uh, Moabites, the Midianites. And they sent women into the camp of Israel to lead their men astray and to seduce them and uh, to deceive them. 
That's ultimately what the enemy had done. And the Lord had told Israel, do not dare take a wife of the Gentile nations. And the Israelites, uh, they, they join themselves with these women. And as they join themselves with these women, the Lord sent a plague among, among the children of Israel. 24,000 were killed. And the Lord spoke to Moses and He said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to put a serpent upon a staff. And I want you to take that serpent upon that staff and I want you to run throughout all of Israel. I want you to go throughout all of Israel that whoever may look upon that staff would live. Amen. That they would yes. live. Now you got to imagine, there's two to three million Israelites that we know of. And that's just men that were numbered. So we're talking about close to 10 million people at this time. Maybe more because they've been reproducing in the wilderness, having children. And Moses has to take this staff throughout all of Israel. I can see it now, Moses, running through the camp with that staff held high, crying out, Look yes. upon the staff and live! Yes. Look upon the staff and live! Amen. Look upon the staff and Amen. live! And then comes after that, they're crying and weeping and apologizing to the Lord, repenting of what they've done at the, uh, at the door of the, the uh, tabernacle of the congregation. And there's a man there, a grandson to, uh, to Aaron. His name is Phinehas. And here comes a Jewish man along with Cosby, the daughter of one of the kings of the Midianites. And Phinehas sees them coming. And he rises up with a spear and he runs to them and he, he, he spears them through, both of them. Because he had seen what sin had done to the children of Israel. And he would not allow sin to, to have one more opportunity in Israel. He rose up in zeal and he smote the, uh, the, the infection that had infected the children of Israel. And the Lord began to speak to Moses uh, after this, and he would say I think that I have turned my plague away from the children of Israel because of the zeal that was upon my servant, Phinehas. And as he would continue to speak to Moses, and you got to understand I'm paraphrasing greatly here, just telling the story. And, uh, but as he would continue to speak to Moses, the Lord would say, I want you to vex the Midianites and strike them. Because of the deception that they have sent among my people. My God, when I read that, uh, it was been a, a week or so ago, when I read that, I felt it in my spirit. Lord, I want to vex the enemy's camp for everything that he's done to my people. For all that he's done to humanity. I want to vex him until the day that I die. The enemy, the accuser, Satan himself. I want to vex his kingdom. And you know what? You have the power today to do that. Yes. You have the power today to do that, to vex the enemy's camp, to come against the enemy's camp in prayer. You can come against the enemy's camp. It's one of the most powerful things that you have to operate in yes. today. You can destroy the work of the enemy. Amen. Through the power of Christ. Yes. By the presence of the Holy Spirit. Yes. You can do so in prayer. We're doing it right now. Right now. We're doing it. We're vexing the enemy. And as I sat there and I watched this lady who refuses to give up, she was eating and as she'd take, she would take a bite, I thought, my God, she's just vexing the enemy with each bite that she takes. Every time that she chooses to use that walker instead of that wheelchair, she's vexing the enemy because her presence in this earth, just because of the faith that's in her, just her presence in the earth, without her saying anything, without her going anywhere, without her giving anything, it is power that is vexing the enemy. And as long as she's alive, she is a threat to the kingdom of darkness. Yes. I thank God for that. So how much can we do? How much can we accomplish for the kingdom of God today? My Lord, and I just, I thought about it. And Lord, I hate what the enemy has done. I hate what the devil has created in humanity. And I hate what he's had the privilege to do through our own disobedience, Lord. I recognize our part. God, forgive us. Forgive us for disobeying you. But Lord, smite the enemy. Smite his work. Destroy the work of the enemy. Lord, we're not ignorant of his ways. We know the thoughts of the enemy. He's come only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Lord, vex his camp. It's become the cry of my heart. I want to see the devil's kingdom torn down. Uh, there's a song. It, it slips my mind. But uh, part of it says, I'm, I'm going up to the enemy's camp 
Uh, to tear the devil's kingdom down, right? It's something like that. To tear the devil's kingdom down. It just fills my heart. I want to see, I want to see the devil's kingdom torn down. It's what I want to see. But this is who we, we are up against. And Jesus says, Peter, this devil, Satan himself, he wants you. He's asked me for you. I love that he has to get permission. Amen. That blesses me. Yes. But he asked for you. Now, this is an arrowist middle indicative to you. That means nothing to me. That means a lot. It makes it a deponent verb. And as a deponent verb, and actually it's the only use of this verb in its, in its structure found in the entirety of the, of the Word of God. The only time it's used in this structure. It literally means to demand a return of property. See, through sin, through the fall of man, Satan earned a legal right to possess humanity. It became legal. And he earned the legal right to become the taskmaster of all of humanity. And he, we became his possession. And you and I, even though we did not sin after the similitude of the sin of Adam, right? That's Romans. Even though we didn't sin the same way Adam sinned, we know that there is sin in us because from the time of Adam to the law, death was in the world and then we continue to die. Death is the proof of sin in the world. David said, I was born in sin and in iniquity did my mother conceive me. We are born in possession of the enemy because we are born with a sinful nature instilled in our heart. We belong to Him. We belonged to Him. But that's how every person who's born, that's how they're born. They're born the property of Satan. And that's because of the fall of Adam. But this is the truth. But from the very moment that Adam fell, the very moment, God, came down in the cool of the day. Oh, I love that. When the day was far spent, after Adam had toiled and finished his day's work, in the cool of the day, God came. When Adam had exhausted all of his efforts to cover his sin, right? Because he hid and he covered himself with fig leaves, right? After he exhausted all of his efforts, God came down in the cool of the day, calling to Adam, God knew what Adam had done. He wasn't ignorant of what Adam had done. He knew what he did. He knew that his creation was separated from him. God would have felt that in his heart the moment it happened. And he came to him. And he called for him. And Adam reluctantly comes. And God establishes his redemption plan in that moment. Amen. In that moment, God established his redemption plan. Which really was established what? Before the foundations of the world. Yes. Before man even fell, God already had a way to, to redeem him. Before man even committed sin, God had a way to forgive him. Before man ever failed, God had a way to redeem him. That's powerful. And from that moment, from that moment that man fell, God has pursued what rightfully belonged to him. He has pursued us with all of his heart, with all of his mind, with all of his strength. That's what he's given over all of heaven to do is to pursue his creation. Yes. He wants us back. Amen. He wanted us back. When I was a, 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 a party boy, uh, immoral and wicked and vile, lost in my sins uh, four and a half years ago, when I was that man, God was pursuing me. Amen. My God. Yes. Wicked and vile and an enemy of God, yet he pursued me with all of his heart. Thank you, Jesus. My Lord yes. and my God. You know, he pursued me so much that he actually spoke to me through technology. Y'all might not believe it, but I'm going to tell it. My mom fought with me for about a year. 
So whether or not a Christian could, be, could drink and be right with God in their heart. Now, of course, we know that there is bondages <coughs> and that people do struggle with these things. But I was trying to condone it. I was trying to make it okay. And that wasn't right. And my mom fought with me for about a year on it. And finally, she sent me a verse of Scripture. She didn't send the whole verse. She just sent the, uh, the, cha the book, the chapter, and the verse. And it was Proverbs 20 and 1. And I thought in my heart, you know what? If that says that a Christian can't drink, I don't want to read it. Because when I go out and drink tomorrow night, I'm going to feel bad about it. <laughs> so I didn't read it. I ignored it. I put it away. That's right. I know it by heart. I'll never forget it. And I'm sitting, I was probably two months later, we are gone to the liquor store. I was on the baseball team in college. We threw all the parties. We had gone to the liquor store. I got my case of probably Bud Light or something nasty. Yeah. And sat it down beside me. And it was always a race to see who could get to the recliner first. I, mean, I won the race that day. I was sitting in that recliner, popped that case of beer down. Pulled my phone out of my pocket. And I had an iPhone at the time that had a little passcode. You know, you got to type in the passcode before it'll open up. And, uh, well, I pulled that phone out of my pocket. And not only was the passcode unlocked, but there was a Bible application opened up on my phone. Mm -hmm. And you want, to know, you want to know what verse was staring me right in the face <laughs> when I pulled out that phone out of my pocket? Yes. Proverbs 20 and 1. Yes. Wine is a mocker. Strong Praise drink God. is raging. Praise God. And whosoever is deceived thereby, is not wise. Yes. Go to the next verse. The fear of a king is as the roaring of a lion, and whoso provoketh him to anger sinneth against his own soul. And all I had been doing was provoking the king and trying to manipulate and to twist scripture that I didn't know anything about to condone what I was doing to condone the immorality that I was living in and yet when I was doing all of that hiding and running away from God he still loved me he still pursued me and he sent his word and his word will never return void and it, re it accomplished that which it was sent to do and I didn't get saved right there I was arrogant and a runner and I continued to run you know that popped up on my phone several times after that too I don't make this stuff up. <laughs> and finally, a couple months later, I asked Jesus Christ into my heart. Amen. And into Amen. my life. Yes. One month later, I was baptized with the Holy Spirit. Yes. Amen. God. See, He pursued me. Yes. He didn't give up on me. Even though the devil got rights. <laughs> uh, Jesus had already been crucified on the cross. Yes. Already, before the devil even got a right, Jesus was already crucified on the cross in the mind of God. Already winning back souls. But God began to establish His redemption plan, line upon line, precept upon precept, beginning with the promise of the seed of the woman who would bruise the head of the serpent, but the serpent would crush His heel, or would bruise His heel. Began there, and then it would it would grow, and there would be prophecies like in uh, Genesis when it talks about the scepter of the lion of the tribe of Judah. The one would come up out of Judah, the offspring that would come up out of Judah. And then you have things like uh, in Numbers when Balaam, a wicked prophet, would prophesy of the coming of the Messiah. And Isaiah would talk about the virgin who would conceive, and we would call his name Emmanuel, meaning God with us. And he began to open it up to us, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, giving us tight, letting us see what was coming. The Bible says that the prophets and the patriarchs of old sought diligently in the scriptures as to the one who was to come. What grace would appear to us in this last day. They sought after it diligently. 
They prophesied of it. They made declarations of it. As the Lord would speak to their hearts. And the redemption plan of God would unfold in a beautiful way. Until finally it came to a point. Where on the banks of the Jordan River. As John the Baptist was standing in the Jordan River. Looked upon the banks of the Jordan. And here comes the Lord Jesus Christ. And he yes. would say behold the yes. Lamb of God. Which taketh away the sin of the world. Yes. Thank you Lord. And at that moment. Redemption had a face. And redemption had a name. Jesus. My God. Jesus. At that point, redemption had a face and redemption had a name. The Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And as redemption was given a face and as it was given a name, John also gave it a work. And he said, he is the Lamb of God. And he has come to take away the sin of the world. Redemption's got a face. Redemption's got a name. Redemption's got a work. His face is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Jew from Nazareth. The carpenter's son. Uh, Joseph and Mary's child. The one who was raised up in Nazareth. The one who confounded all of the doctors and lawyers in the temple at the age of 12. Jesus Christ. He's got a name. His name is Jesus. And he's done a work. And that was his work that he accomplished on Calvary tree as he shed his blood for me and you oh yes <laughs> oh yes and where Satan brought us into captivity of sin Jesus Christ has manifested redemption and life so he pursued us Jesus stepped in and strong armed the devil in Matthew eleven twelve. 12 Matthew eleven twelve, 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence. Why? Because now redemption has a face and now redemption has a name and he is God with us come to take away the sin of the world. So I was over here. This is the kingdom of darkness and over there will be the kingdom of light. Jesus Christ came and grabbed me up. And this all happened a lot faster than what I'm going to do. Grabbed me up out of the grip of Satan. The violent take it by force. And he planted me down in the kingdom of his dear son. One minute I was a property of the devil. The next minute I'm shouting the glories of heaven. Living in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Glory to God. Look at Colossians 1 and 13. Colossians 1 and 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Immediately I was snatched up. Now can you imagine the devil sitting on his little throne with a whip in his hand controlling my every movement, my life. And then where'd he go? Where's he at? What just happened? And then it hits him. Jesus Christ. So one minute he's driving me like a hard taskmaster. The next minute I'm gone. The next minute I'm gone. Because Jesus has come and grabbed me. And translated me into the kingdom of his dear son. And this is now my new environment. Where I'm not being tortured and harassed and beaten any longer. But I'm being supplied and nourished and cared for by the kingdom of God. Amen. That's powerful. That's glorious. And now that that's the truth. Now we're in a fight of faith. Because the devil doesn't give up easy. And as Jesus would say to Peter. Satan has desired to have you. He's desired to have you. This is going to be an all out warfare for our faith. Mm. Yes. Soldier, you're in a warfare. Each and every one of you are soldiers in the army of God. And you need to know that you're not in a, in a point of uh, no combat. You're living in the middle of a war zone. Yes. This is the reality of the thing. Satan is taking every opportunity, every advantage he can get. Anything that he can get a hold of and a foothold on, he is going to use it in your life to come against your faith. Your faith is so valuable. Your faith is so precious. And he wants to destroy it. 
Because your faith destroys his kingdom. Yes. Amen. Amen. Because yes. your faith in what Christ has done for you at Calvary puts the Holy Spirit in motion yes. and he begins to tear down parts of the devil's Amen. kingdom. Amen. Amen. Yes. And he hates it. And he's going to do everything he can. He's going to he's going to come after you in a mighty way. It says um, in, in Matthew chapter 3, 11 and 12, it talks about the purifying agent of the, of the Holy Spirit, how he's going to come and purify you. He's going to lay you upon the threshing floor. You're going to be threshed. You're going to you the chaff is going to be removed from the wheat and the chaff is going to be pulled up and put into the fire and be burned with unquenchable fire. That's a, that's the sanctification process. That's what we're in. Now listen, in the time of Israel, the threshing floor was always subject to thievery. In fact, families would often move their entire family out to the threshing floor and live there until all the wheat was gathered away. Because until all of that wheat was harvested, it was subject to being stolen. While we're in this earth, we are subject to to the works of the enemy. Amen. We have to understand where we're living at this time. In this earth, we are subject to the work of the enemy. And he is going to take every effort and every opportunity to destroy the faith that we have in our hearts and lives. Yes. And we're subject to it. The devil wants it back. He wants to take it back. He wants everything that has been taken away from him. He wants it back because he wants to corrupt God's creation. He is anti-God from the word go. And he wants to corrupt it. But Jesus said to Peter, but I have prayed for thee. Hallelujah. That thy faith fell Thank not. Thank you, Jesus. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Yes. The Lord did not reject the devil's request. The Lord has not rejected the devil's request. Let me show you something. Job chapter 1, verse 8 through 12. Start at verse 8. The Lord is going to give the devil the opportunity. He'll allow him to leave with him. And the Lord said to Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? That there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and eschews evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear you for no reason? I mean, look at what all you've done for him. Let us see what Satan will list off. Have you not made a hedge about him, about his house, about all that he has on every side? And have you not blessed the work of his hands and his substance and increase in the land? But put forth thy hand now and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. This is what the devil's telling the Lord. If you give me the opportunity, I'm going to make him curse you to your face. I'm going to make him deny you. I'm going to make him turn away from you. I'm going to destroy his faith. But the devil didn't fail just once with Job. He fell twice. In uh, 2 and 3... Another opportunity. He says, you know, Lord, I know I took everything that he has. I took all of that. I took his family. I took his possessions. I took all of that. But if you let me touch his body, that's the key. That's the key, Lord. If you let me touch his body, he'll curse you to your face. He'll deny you. He'll walk away from you. Let me just touch his body. Let me take from his, his physical body. And the Lord said, you can touch his body, but you cannot have his life. See, the devil's got boundaries. He can't go but so far. Yes. But he is allowed certain leeways. And with Job, they were great. <coughs> they were great. But again, the devil fails and Job doesn't curse God to his face. But Job makes a fool of himself before God. Even though Job didn't curse God, even though Job didn't deny God, he still made a fool of himself. So much so that God had to show up on the sea and say, Hey, Job, you're really willing to condemn me that you can justify yourself? I know you're a righteous man, Job, but don't ever condemn me to prove that you're a righteous man. Don't ever condemn what I've allowed and what I've done to prove that you're a righteous man. But... 
Job had to repent. And then after he repented for what he had done, you know what God told him to do? For those three idiots, excuse me, sorry. I shouldn't have said that. For those three bozos who thought they knew something, and the other one we don't even mention, right? Because God left him out of the whole thing. He was just a young, not, knew nothing kind of guy. But for those three guys that had condemned Job and told Job that there must be sin in his life, what did God tell him to do for them? <coughs> Go offer up sacrifice for them. And what did sacrifice represent? Cleansing of sins. Forgiveness of sins. So God was going to forgive those three men. Job was going to be used as the high priest to offer up the sacrifice for them. See, because after Job had returned to the Lord, after he had repented and said, God, I've talked about things I don't know about. They're too great for me. I don't understand them. Forgive me, Lord. My eyes, I once heard of you with the hearing of my ears, but now my eyes have seen you. I know you in a greater way, Lord. I've been strengthened. I've been, I've been changed, Lord. And I thank you for what you put me through. And God used him to strengthen his brethren. Just like he's told Peter to do. See, because once you go through the fire and you might fail God, you can still get back up. Because the Lord has prayed for you. It literally means that He has begged for you. Some translations actually will put it in the Bible. That He begged for you. It's, uh, again, I'm going to use Greek. It's a passive voice. And it reduces it to a want. So this is something that God wants. You know what that means? This is the will of God. That you would be, that your faith would not fail. It's the will of God for each and every one of us that our faith would not fail. He's not willing to cast any of us out. He wants all of our faith to stand true and stand strong. In the midst of the fire, even when you're laying on the ground on the threshing floor and the chaff is still on the floor with you. How ugly is that? When God's broken away the chaff and you're laying on the floor and you're looking at your failures. You're looking at your inconsistencies. You're looking at everything that's wrong with you. Because it's right there in your face. There's still wheat. And if you begin to see the chaff, that means it's beginning to be broken off of you. Glory to God. See, even when you fail, it's an opportunity for you to grow. Even when you fail the Lord, it's an opportunity for you to grow in the Lord. If you begin to see the chaff breaking off of you, that's be, if you begin to see the chaff laying on the floor and it's ugly and it doesn't look good and it's weighing you down and it's burying you, that's because it's being broken off of you. And that's a good thing because it's soon to be gathered up and be burned with unquenchable fire, never to bother you again. That failure, that inconsistency, that's about to never bother you again. And says that he's prayed for you that your faith would not fail. The most valuable material in the earth. And it's being sought after by two parties. The kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of God. And God <coughs> has already prayed for you that your faith would not fail. You may have failed the Lord. But God has already prayed for you Amen. that your faith yes. would not fail. You, and when you are converted, literally means when you are turned about. It doesn't mean to turn around. It means to turn towards. So we're not talking about being born again and, and, and having to be saved. We're talking about Peter failed. He denied the Lord three times. The Lord said, when you turn towards me. It just means that when you have asked me to help you in the midst of your failure. When you've asked me to help you in the midst of that failure. Then you go and strengthen your brother. And it literally means to uh, make them steadfast in mind. Mm -hmm. See, because after what you have gone through, when you fell the Lord and the Lord picked you up and strengthened you, you know, what did the Lord do for Peter while he's hiding in that room? <clears throat> he showed up and he breathed on them. He breathed on them because he hadn't given up on them. Peter tried to, <laughs> listen guys, Peter just doesn't get it really easy. He, he made several attempts to go back to his old life. But the Lord showed up every time. Amen. Every single time. And yes. breathed on him. 
Amen. And he's going to do that for us every time we're going out of the way, every time that we're wandering from the right path, every time that we're failing, every time he's going to show up and he'll breathe on us. Yes. Thank he's going to show up for us. Yes. And when you have experienced the returning to the Lord, you go and you tell that next person who's laying in the pit, there is a way out. Amen. His name is Jesus. The Amen. cross is taken care of it. Amen. You are not condemned. You are forgiven. Amen. Stand up, dust your feet, dust the dirt off of your back, and yes. keep on marching, soldier. Yes. Because this is a warfare. And we're not going to let anybody fall to the enemy. Yes. Strengthen your brother. Yes. Make them steadfast in mind. Yes. Encourage their heart, their spirit, their soul. Strengthen them in the midst of their failures and in their inconsistencies and in their wanderings. Quit throw, casting a condemning eye and beating them down with a condemning bat. But pick them up. Lift them up. Encourage them. Tell them that the way they're going is wrong. But there is another way. And He will give you the strength to walk in the way. Strengthen the brethren. Strengthen the brethren. Don't condemn the brethren. Because trust me, if they're failing, they feel the weight. Now, if they're truly, if they're just rebellious, there is a time where you give them over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. But that doesn't mean that you condemn them. Mm. What you're doing is in an effort to cause them to return. It's all redemptive. Everything that we do should be redemptive in nature, in heart, and in mind. Everything. <clears throat> and I just got to tell you guys about what the Lord did for me with this passage. I can take you back to the day. It was the very first Gabriel Swigert rally. That night, as I sat there, I went to the rally. It was in Alabama, Birmingham, Alabama. As I sat there, and the Lord began uh, to really to, to warn me of what was about to take place in my life. It was going to be a time of great testing. And a lot of it would come from an inward testing. A lot that He was about to show me about myself that I would have never imagined would be there. Things that I wouldn't even want to think could be there. And the Lord began to warn me of it. And from that moment, actually, let me tell you this story as well that goes along with it. I had a woman who uh, that very night, she had a dream about me and my wife. My wife wasn't able to make it today. I miss her. I wish she was here. It's okay. She, was, uh, she has family that she needed to be with today. So. Um, but the Lord began to show me that, and this woman has a dream. And in the dream, my wife and I were there, and all she said was, and she had it three different times that night, is that Jesus was sitting at the table with us, Saying, you're going to make it through. You're going to make it through. You're going to make it through. And she messaged me on Facebook, told me about the dream she had. And I'd already been feeling the weight of what I was about to travel through. It had nothing to do with my wife, honestly. It really didn't. It was it, everything that was about to happen was inwardly with myself. Things that I would have to deal with. And for a year and a half to two years. I would fight the greatest battle of faith that I had ever experienced up until that moment. And one day as I'm sitting in church, and uh, when you're going through it like that, sometimes it's hard to even be sensitive to the Holy Spirit when He's around you. Sometimes it's hard to even feel Him at all. Yes. And to go through that for, for a year and a half, you know, some people would, would want to tell you, you know, maybe it's sin in your life, Paris. Maybe, maybe it's because you got sin in your life. You need to deal with it. That's why God won't overshadow you with His presence. <laughs> no, that wasn't it. There were some inward things I had to deal with, but God was testing me. God was trying me. God was allowing the enemy the opportunity. And as I sat there, my mother-in-law walked up to me. And she didn't know anything about anything that was going on within. But she walked up to me and she said, Paris, Satan has desired to have you. Satan has desired to have you. But I have prayed for you. That your faith fell not. She was speaking of the passage. What I was going through, she had no idea of. But what she came to tell me that day, she could have had no idea of what it would mean to me. And there, right in the middle of the sanctuary, this is after service, I began to weep. 
and to thank God that He spoke to my heart. That no matter how dark, no matter how hot, no matter how painful the experience would grow, He had already prayed for me. Amen. That my faith fell not. Yes. Amen. And look at me today. This is not to brag about myself. Don't get it wrong. But look at me today. I'm here privileged with the opportunity after having traveled through something and been strengthened by the Lord through it to tell you that whatever you're going through, whatever wandering, whatever failure, whatever inconsistency it is that you're struggling with, there's a way out through the blood of Jesus Christ. Yes. Whatever it is, the yes. blood of Jesus Christ has paid it all. And he said that if you have sinned, that you have, you have an advocate of the Father. And that that advocate is faithful and he is just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Yes. He's faithful. Amen. He's faithful. Amen. And the blood covers it all. Sam, can I get you to come up? I, I want to tell one more story. And uh, it's just, it goes along with the same theme. And we're going to have Sam kind of illustrate it in a sense. There was a man in the 18th century named Robert Robinson. And uh, he was a man who was, um, he lost his father at a young age. And uh, he, um, he had lost his father at a young age. And he joined a little rowdy gang and became an apprentice to a barber. And while he was working for this barber and a part of this rowdy little group of guys, uh, they came across a drunken gypsy one night. And they began to pour a liquor down her throat kind of harassing her in a sense and giving her a hard time and demanding that she tell them their future. And she pointed right at Robert Robinson and said, he's going to grow old to see his children and his grandchildren. And it struck a chord in Robert's heart. He began to think, if I'm going to grow old to see my children and my grandchildren, the life that I'm living ain't going to get me there. And there was a man by the name of George Whitefield a fiery Methodist preacher in the 18th century. He was a contemporary of John and Charles Wesley. Men of God. True men of the faith. And they were some powerful preachers. And one time George Whitefield was recorded to say, I'm not going to be a velvet mouth preacher. <coughs> in other words, he wasn't going to be soft. He was going to tell it like it was. He was going to preach it like it was. Which was quite different from the priestly Catholicism that ruled that day. And as he uh, sat there under the preaching of George Whitefield, he invited his gang to come along with him to listen to the message so that they could heckle the preacher. And as George Whitefield was preaching, he stopped and he said, You brood of vipers, who hath warned you to free, to flee from the wrath to come? John the Baptist's message to the religious leaders of that day. And it struck a chord in George Whitefield. I mean, in, in Robert Robinson. Struck a chord in his heart. And for three years, he lived under the weight of that conviction. Till finally he accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. Asked him into his heart and into his life, and he got saved. And immediately he went and he became a Methodist preacher. And he would begin to preach. And he was a fiery preacher himself. Trying to preach like the man who really touched his heart. And as he was preaching, he began to write some hymns. And um, that, one of the hymns that he wrote was a song entitled, Come Thou Fount. I'm sure you've heard, heard it. Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. And as he wrote that song, it was published, and it was, uh, it was published in the Methodist hymnal. And Sam, if you could.
this, and when I first heard this hymn, it was a story that I heard with it. It's rumored that Mr. Robinson, though a preacher, though writing such a powerful hymn, wandered away from the Lord some years later. And a young lady hopped on a stagecoach one day, traveling to who knows where, and she was humming that 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 song in her heart and and it started to come through her mouth and she began to hum it a little bit and sing it a little bit and she noticed this old man sitting in the back and she looked at him and she said sir what what do you think about this song it's strengthened me so greatly it's helped me so greatly what do you think about this song and he tried to get her to talk about anything else but she just was persistent wanted to know what he thought about the song And finally he said, Madam, I am the poor and unhappy man who wrote that hymn many years ago. And I would give a thousand worlds if I had them to enjoy the feelings I had then. And that young lady looked at that man, Mr. Robert Robinson, old now, wandered away from the Lord. And she said, Sir, the streams of mercy are still flowing. Glory to God. The streams of mercy, Mr. Robinson, they're still flowing for you. And he rededicated his heart to the Lord and he wrote this stanza. Today the streams of mercy are flowing for whatever the need.